Good morning. My name is Chris Gordon. I am the Programming Manager for Readings and I am delighted to welcome each and everyone here today. But before we get going, we should all just take a little moment out of our busy lives to reflect that wherever we live, actually in this beautiful world, but in particular in Australia, we're living, of course, on land that's not owned by us. It's owned by the First Nations people. And I would like to pay my respects and to give my gratitude to the people of the Kulin Nation. That's where I'm speaking from at the moment in Melbourne. And pay my respects and just say thank you. Thank you for letting me live in this beautiful country to their elders, past, present and emerging. And now... I've got to just sit here and gas bag with a quite extraordinary artist, John Corson, who's got a beautiful new book, The Rock from the Sky. John, you got started quite some time ago, but it wasn't drawing picture books. No, it was drawing, um, well, it's hard when you start to count what counts, but uh, my first jobs were in animation. I went to school for that and... uh, I thought I was going to work at that my whole life. I really liked the idea. I didn't ever want to be a freelance or artist type because that's really scary. <laughs> I don't know how you make money. And, well, you know, people, want... pe- <laughs> it's, yeah, people do it. It turns out they do, but I didn't know how. And it certainly didn't seem like a job you could go to school for. And I heard about animation was really big, especially in the 90s when I was a kid. Disney was hiring all these people and making these big movies again. And that's what I wanted to do. And so I went to school for that. Um, but I hate animating, it turns out. I'm terrible at it. Just because you like to draw and can draw even doesn't mean you're going to like animating or be any good at it. It's a whole different skill. In fact, it doesn't even correlate very much to your skill at drawing at first. And you can be not a great drawer and an amazing animator, it turns out. Even those two skills aren't related that much. But anyway, it wasn't my thing. But I still liked the idea of a job. And so I went to the studios for uh, design work. I did sets and props for um, future movies for about ten, yeah, seven years, seven, eight years before books started up in the evenings. And then once I met books in the evenings, that was it. I, I had to get out of the animation because it just suited my sensibilities so well. It was just the best. Because you've won so many wonderful awards for your drawing and for your writing on your beautiful picture books. Where do these ideas come from, John? Do they come because you're a parent yourself or do they come because you're a child? <laughs> you've never quite grown up. <laughs> I'm definitely more of a child than a parent. It's dangerous. We have we have kids ourselves. We have two boys and uh, I'm faking it for sure. <laughs> I don't know something that comes natural to me. But it is, I think that that's what it is. I think, I, I, I ask that question all the time of other, like not directly, but I think about that a lot. Whether people who do children's books or children's entertainment just generally whether they do it out of a fondness for their own childhood or whether they're still working something out, maybe both. But I have really great memories of picture books in particular and just the places they took me and those experiences of reading. I really loved it. And so I, it took me ages to figure out even, I think my art for animation was even going towards what I remember picture books without knowing that. And then finally, when I got into picture books again, I was like, oh, I've been chasing this for 10 years and not knowing it. Um, It was just like this lightning bolt moment. Yeah, I just have great memories of it when I was little. Uh, so when you when you are sort of creating a new story, like, and let's talk about The Rock from the Sky that I know that you are going to read from mm-hmm. today, what, I, what, what strikes me about your, your word is the simplicity of it all, that these, is, is that a very conscious decision that you're not going to use words that are complicated or have mixed meanings? Well, I would say the first for sure, as far as the phonetics go, I think that sm- simple words can have very complicated meanings. I think it's yeah, actually of course, easier of course. to put them in. And that's why I like it, actually, is because you sort of, the more you strip it down, the more complex it gets if you do it a certain way. And I really appreciate that about them. And not to, I mean, you can get lost in this and talk about making picture books for adults rather than kids or things that kids won't get. But I don't think that's the aim. I don't think it's to sort of do something simple for the two-year-olds and then give something philosophical for the older ones or anything. I think that everyone sort of feels, hopefully, the same general goal in these books that I have. I'm, I'm, I'm trying for that anyway. I don't want it to be this three-tiered thing or whatever that you know has yeah. three different levels of stuff. But the simplicity of it all is very deliberate because it's the only way I get anything done without hating it. Um, so what's I the process? That, do you write? Do you write? You sort of come up with a storyline and then you just start? No, I think it's a premise. It's always a visual premise, usually for picture books. I find that's the easiest because, again, you are talking to two-year-olds a lot of time or even younger sometimes and if they don't get the words whatever they are you still want 
at the end of this book, there better be a rock on the ground somewhere, right? It's called the rock. <laughs> that's the right. If you can fulfill that, that's a really nice sort of marker to keep, you know, it's a big foggy forest. And if you have this thing in front of you, like I got to land a rock, then it's very helpful as a, as an author. You don't have to, you don't, but I am sort of slowly learning to wander off and come back. And that's been new for this book. And maybe the last one too, the, the third half book I did where I, I, I let myself sort of wander off a little bit. And then I think the turtle one, we found a hat just floats away. I'm not even sure I landed what I was aiming for there. But this one, at least I had this rock. And then once <laughs> the rock has landed, then I wandered off. The whole book, it was just ad-libbed after that. I did not have a plan. I had a very loose um, sort of visual idea of what I wanted. There was like a forest I wanted in the middle of the book just to vary it up so that we weren't dealing with a flat plane the whole book. Just for visual sake, not, not, I didn't have a story for it. But once you begin to sort of satisfy that visual impulse, sat, like backing it up, is the story, whatever that ends up being, you just sort of chip away at what's believable to get you that visual. And then that's what happens. There's someone from the audience called Erin and she's asked me, well, asked you, how do you get the comedic timing right? How do you do that? And do you, do you kind of crack yourself up when you're there in your beautiful <laughs> uh, drawing studio going, actually, I am a funny, I am a funny bloke. You have to do it a little bit. I think that all <laughs> authors sort of toggle wildly between like, I am the best at the world at this. And then also I'm going to walk into traffic and never come back because I can't do <laughs> that. Those are the two poles. There's nothing in between. But when you're laughing, it's really nice. Um, and, and that is the hope is that if it cracks you up, then it will hopefully crack them up. And you have to sort of freeze that because when you're laughing, it's a very spontaneous thing. Yeah. And so you have to almost like catch it like a bug and be like, what, what was that? Why did I laugh there? Because you don't often know. And so, and then heightening that and sort of building it up and making sure you're taking care of that to make, and not killing it or just heightening it if you can. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I find with this one, especially it was about lengthening the joke. My impulse every time I wanted to do something to the story was to see how far we could take the joke before, like how long can a rock be hanging in the sky before it's time <laughs> to land that rock and you, your audience isn't angry at you or all those events, the sunset, how long does it take for a turtle to block the sunset? And like, not very long, it turns out. You only get about four pages <laughs> for to get angry. But you find that out. You have to, you just, I read this thing the other day that was really helpful and it sort of squared with what I think too is that like the main skill of this job is rereading and rereading yeah. um, as a blank slate to try and clear your mind and be like, I'm nobody, or at least I've never seen this before. So what do I think? And that's the only job. That's the whole thing. But it's really fun to do that because you are sort of, but it's very rewarding when people get it because it turns out you did that correctly. And I imagine you read to your sons. They're the first, uh, your first crit critiques. <laughs> no, absolutely. They haven't seen this book yet. We've had this oh, book for no. about a month. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I, I'm too Why? I, just, I probably need therapy for it. I don't know. They, <laughs> they, find, they find the other books. They find, I want my hat back. They find every now and then because there's just copies around that I'm going to mail out or something like that. So what's this? And I can, don't, worry, don't worry about that. We're going to read something else. But they do find it. And um, they like that one. Or at least the older one does. The two-year-old still doesn't know what to make of it. Um, but this one, they know all the characters because the drawings have been around, but I can't, I can't bring myself uh -huh. to do it yet. Kids too, when you, when you're working on a book, kids, especially they want to be helpful. And so if you're like, what do you think? Like, tell me what you think of this. They get the idea that it's in progress and they want to help so bad. And so even if it's perfect, even if it's just fine, because that's probably when you're showing it, you're not going to show something, you know, is off probably. So when you like it and you're like, what do you think? They're like, Oh, this part is bad. And you're like, oh, now I'm back. Like, I, didn't know you. I wanted you to praise me. That's really why we're talking. I don't want your critique. And that's with your friends and everybody. It's like, don't actually critique this thing. Just tell me I'm a genius and move on. But everyone has notes. <laughs> and so I find I do less and less of that. I have a couple bookmaking friends where we bounce things off. But it's, um, it's a very delicate talk. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. Will you read a little for us? Will yeah, you sure. That? Yeah, The absolutely. Rock from the Sky. The Rock from the Sky. <laughs> It doesn't take long to do the whole book, so I might do that, if that's okay. Let's do that. All right. So if everyone can see that this is the rock from the sky, it is about a turtle and this thing, which I haven't nailed down quite. Uh, I know this is actually a tortoise. He's not even a turtle. And this thing is some sort of a cross between an armadillo and a mole. But I'm going to say turtle and mole just because phonetically it just seems smoother. And that's that. I'm on the side of the zoom. And that's what we're going to do. Um, so here's the first page, this giant rock sort of falling and the title page with the same title. Now, this book has uh, five stories, and each one of them has a title page like that. And this first story is called The Rock, and there's nothing on it but a little pink flower at the bottom. And here comes our turtle to stand next to the flower. And he says, I like standing in this spot. It is my favorite spot to stand. 
I don't ever want to stand anywhere else. You know what's great too is that I am Canadian, but I live in California, but I got a Canadian edition to read to you guys, so the spelling would be right. And now a giant rock is above this turtle somewhere, falling. There's little pebbles that I had to put in there to make sure they knew it was falling. I didn't want those pebbles. I hated drawing those pebbles, but they needed to be there for storytelling purposes. Now here's the mole. He's entered the scene, and the turtle is still where he was. And the turtle says, hello. And the mole says, hello, what are you doing? And the turtle says, I am standing in my favorite spot. Come, stand in it with me. Okay. So now the mole has moved closer to the spot, and they're both standing in it. And the turtle says, what do you think of my spot? And the mole says, actually, I have a bad feeling about it. A bad feeling? Yes. And now the mole points to a spot way over there, way far away at the other end of the thing. And he says, there is another spot over there. Do you see it? Yes, I see it. I will go and stand in it to see if it feels better than this spot. So the mole goes over there. And now he's standing there. And the turtle is standing there. And the turtle says, how does that spot feel? It's all in caps, so you know. And the mole says, I cannot hear you. You are too far away. I am going to come back. Now the rock is still falling. No words on this page again. So the mole is back and the turtle says, does this spot still feel bad? And the mole says, yes, it feels even worse than before. I'm going back to the other spot. Do you want to come with me? The turtle says, no, I will stay here. This is my favorite spot. The mole says, are you sure? And the turtle says, yes. So the mole goes back to that spot and he's looking pretty sad about it. And the turtle, it's hard to say, he's just looking at his flower. Right? But here comes a snake into the mole's area. The snake doesn't speak in this book. He shows up a couple times, but snakes scare me very badly. So it was enough to put them in the book, much less give them a voice. And the mole says, oh, hello. I am standing in this spot by myself. Come, stand in it with me. The turtle's way over there sees these two hanging around by the new spot. And he says, my spot is better. And the mole says, you are too far away to hear. The turtle starts to walk away from his spot towards the other two. And he says, I am coming closer. And the mole says, we still cannot hear you. And the turtle makes it all the way over. And he says, my spot, I said my spot is better. And now, of course, is the only time we can land the rock. And it falls on the turtle's spot and destroys it. And they look very surprised about that. And that's the end of the first story. This is the longest story, just so you know. It won't be like that for all of them. The second story is called The Fall. And now it's been, it's been a little while. Hard to say if it's the same day or next day or whatever. But it's been a little minute. And the turtle has found a way to climb on the rock, as you would, probably. But only for now, because the first page of the story finds him on the ground, upside down. And the mole finds him there. And the turtle says, hello. And the mole says, hello. What happened? And the turtle says, nothing. And the mole comes closer and he says, were you climbing on it? And the turtle says, no. Did you fall off? No. And the mole comes around. And he says, do you need help? And the turtle says, no, I do not need help. And the mole says, okay, I never need help. Okay. So the mole sits down and the turtle says, what are you doing? And the mole says, I came to take a nap. It's nice under here. You can take a nap too if you want. There's just enough room for two. And the turtle says, no, I am not tired. And the mole says, okay. And the mole closes his eyes. And the turtle says, I am never tired. And the mole says, okay. And now they're both asleep, taking a nap under the rock. And that's the end of that story. I almost called that story The Seven Lies, but the publisher didn't really like it. They thought it was bad. <laughs> All right. This next story is called The Future. There we go. Okay. So the mole is sitting on top of the rock with his eyes closed, looking very serene. And the turtle finds him there. And the turtle says, What are you doing? And the mole says, I like to close my eyes and imagine into the future. And the turtle says, are you doing it right now? And the mole says, yes, come, close your eyes and do it with me. So it pans out and there's now there's little plants growing up around the rock. 
little flowers and stuff. And the mole says, in the future, this spot will look different. New things will grow. New plants and trees will come. A whole forest, maybe. And the forest has gotten even bigger, and the turtle says, it is nice here. And the mole says, yes, it is. When this thing comes out of the woods, don't know what it is, neither do they. And the turtle says, wait, what is that? Does something live here? And the mole says, maybe, I don't know. And that thing comes across a flower and sort of has his eye sort of buzzing or something. Who knows what, what's going on there? There's like some rings around the eye. He's very happy to see it or energized anyway. And the turtle says, what is it? And the mole says, we are in the future. I don't know what it is. And the turtle says, what is it doing? And the mole says, shh, it will hear you. Then the thing blasts the flower with some sort of death ray coming out of his eye and fries it to a crisp. And the turtle says, ah! And the mole says, shh. And now the thing leaves and he's left this charred remain of a flower. And the turtle is still screaming, ah! But they don't look like they're screaming because they're still imagining into the future. That was the great part about this story. I didn't have to draw that. And the mole says, okay, okay, I think it's going. Okay, it's gone. The turtle says, I don't want to imagine into the future with you anymore. That's the end of that story. Fourth story, we're almost there. It's called The Sunset. And we find the mole and the snake sitting against the rock, watching the sunset happening. And the mole says, I like to sit and watch the sunset. My favorite part is at the very end. This is a good spot to watch it from. There is nothing in the way. Now here comes the turtle. He shows up at the far side of the page. And he says, hello. And the mole says, hello. And the turtle says, what are you doing? And the mole says, we are watching the sunset. And the turtle says, I did not hear you. I am going to come closer. So the turtle comes closer, right in front of the sunset. And he says, okay, what are you doing? And the mole says, we are watching the sunset. And the turtle says, I still cannot hear you. <laughs> and he comes closer. Well, he hasn't come closer. He hasn't moved, actually. But the sunset is over. And he says, I am going to come closer again. I don't know why he took so long between saying those two lines, but he did. And now he's very close to them. And he says, OK, what are you doing? And the mole says, we are not doing it anymore. And now the last story. We made it. The fifth story is called No More Room, and it's deep at night. The mole and the snake have gone to sleep underneath the rock, and the turtle has found them there in his napping spot, as he would think, it, as he would think of it. And he says, I see. I see how it is. Just enough room for two. So he starts to walk away, and he says, maybe I will go to the other spot by myself. Maybe I will never come back. And the other two haven't woken up yet. They're still asleep, and that's not good enough for the turtle. So he turns around and yells, I said, maybe I will never come back. And they start to wake up. And the turtle says, maybe I am too far away for them to hear. But our old friend is coming up behind him now. Let me see if I can show you that. There we go. And now the other two have definitely seen that guy. But maybe they're too scared to see anything, say anything. And so the turtle comes back. He's starting to walk back. And he says, I will go back closer and tell them again. And this thing is following him. And the other two are still just frozen in shock and fear. So the turtle makes it all the way back. And he said, I said, maybe I will never come back. And this thing is about ready to go again. He's going to fry them all to smithereens. And then a giant rock lands on him. And I like this page a lot because right now, this is the first time the snake has seen any of this. He didn't even see the forest part. He doesn't know what the heck just happened. But the other two are just as scared, too. And then the very last page is the rock under the moon and the mole's old spot having barely survived all of this. And it's still, it's probably going to be okay. And that's the end of that book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, such a beautiful story, such a beautiful story. <laughs> but you. what I want to know is if you had to be one of those characters, you're clearly not the snake. Um, I don't know. There's an obliviousness to him that I relate to, certainly. He doesn't know what's going on at all, and that's how I feel most of the time. <laughs> I um, don't believe that for one minute. No, it's, this, <laughs> that's very true. I think that this book has a compendium of who I am 
in different relationships, right? I think that depending on who you're with, you are the turtle and you're just jealous and angry all the time over something in the setup. And then other times you're the mole who doesn't want to say anything to maybe break this not very rewarding thing that you're in anyway. And then other times you're the snake who doesn't feel like he has any business anywhere. <laughs> but he's pretty chill about it anyway because no one seems to be asking him to leave. I don't know. I don't think that, yeah, I think that when I wrote it, uh, it felt like the only sort of move I knew was to make the turtle I didn't know how to get him out of there at first. That first story, when he introduces himself and he says, I'm going to stand right here, and then we have a rock, I must have spent months trying to get him out of there. I didn't believe any reason he had for leaving. He says, this is my spot. Yeah. And the only time it worked was when the snake came out and made him jealous. And then I was like, oh, interesting. So now he likes this mole. He's treated him very badly the whole story, kind of, or at least not with very much care. And suddenly, the only thing to move him is this threat to his relationship with this mole. And so then I knew I had a book. I had four more, at least a couple more stories in it, um, because that was the only thing that believably moved him. Until then, it was sort of a boring story about the mechanics of moving out of the way of a rock. It didn't really grab you. So which one do you enjoy drawing the most? The turtle, the rock, the mole, the snake, the plant, the future, oh. which is actually terrifying. And where did that inspiration come from i like drawing the rock best but a close second is the turtle because i do like eyes I, I rail against drawing characters a lot but that's just being snobby i do like drawing characters and the, and the turtle you can screw him up all sorts of ways and he still looks like a turtle so that's my favorite guy to draw um, a rock you can screw up a lot too and it still looks like a rock but there's just nothing to grab onto unless he's falling on a turtle um the alien came out of that idea we talked about where i just had three stories of just nothing scenic wise but a horizon and a rock and I thought, we got to give him something. Let's grow. I was watching, there's a Disney movie called The Sword and the Stone. Um, and at the very beginning of The Sword and the Stone, they're doing the preamble, the setup to this story about how the sword got put into the, uh, the, the anvil that you have to take it out of. And it's a beautiful illustration they have right then of this sword getting overgrown. It's gorgeous. It's, really, it's got this great fade and this just silhouetted storm and all these ivy and leaves growing out of it. And I just thought, that's the moment. I, I want this thing to grow somehow. I want that to be going around the rock and some trees. Let's just do that. I don't know how to get there. And I started writing the story, and I got to the page where the turtle says, it's very nice here. And the mole says, yes, it is. And they were thinking what I was thinking. And I was like, what have I done? We got This is the end of the story. I got nothing. And then it just that guy just walked out. Like That's the best stuff that happens in stories, is that you just there's no other way to explain it, and it sounds really artsy. And I don't think I believed in it until it started happening with my stuff. But some things just walk out on you and you don't really know wh where they're coming from. And you can make, you know, smart sounding comments about it later. But I just thought, mm -hmm. you know, we, we got to ramp it up. And what's the, what also what are kids are going to like? You know, kids are going to like, ho hopefully that was my impulse there was like, we've asked a lot of them. Those two guys just spent six pages going down for a nap. Our three-year-olds <laughs> are upset. Let's give them a one-eyed alien that fries things to sort of get them back a little bit. And so that was the idea. A lot of it was. You're like the... Uh Wedding for Godot of the children's books. Like something, <laughs> something's got to happen. <laughs> that was the, I mean, that was a huge inspiration for sure is that play. And that's mm -hmm. always been, his writing has always been very big for me because of how yeah. little he needs to do what he's doing. Yeah. This is a Samuel Beckett play for those that don't know. And it's about two blokes that are waiting for something. They're waiting. They're just sitting by the side of the road and, you know, things happen, but uh, <laughs> well, the future comes. Certainly the future comes. Well, he's so good though. He's able to pull it off without a rock. Um, that was the other thing about this book was that I like to draw waiting for Godot style stuff, but I'm not good enough to pull off actually nothing happening where he, people come in and out of that play, but largely he maintains that premise and I needed a rock to kind of give me permission. There was a Hitchcock talk I saw about suspense and he's describing a scene where people are sitting around talking in a very boring scene and then suddenly a bomb goes off after five minutes of this. And he says, I take the same scene and go back and tell your audience there was a bomb the whole time. And now this very boring conversation turns very exciting because they, they know more than the characters do. And I thought, like, right away, it just all clicked and fell mm. into place. Where it was like, yeah. that's what I want. I want boring-looking books, but I need this bomb under the table or whatever it is. And the rock from the sky is better than a bomb under you the table. You need suspense. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's building suspense or building tension anyway for lack of, like, just whatever it is. Um, that was really instructive hearing that. So, like, that's, it's about getting permission for the book you want. I can't have a boring story and boring pictures. I need... They're not boring, by the way. They're actually really <laughs> Well, I, I, they, I think they're not boring. I think that I like them because I liked making them. But uh, you would be surprised how little two- and three-year-olds care about how pretty your book is <laughs> unless well, you've got something going on. Lo I've lovely Leah uh, in our audience has said that her two-year-old has asked for the story again. So she, uh, she, the two-year-old is thinking, okay, full, full credit to you, John. 
I think, you can yeah, well, I, and you can't engineer food. that. There's no knowing when that's going to happen. I've had books that I thought were going to be just fine and they don't connect at all. And then ones like this where I thought this is for, who knows who this is for? This is for me and like four people I know. And then it's, it's actually connected <laughs> fairly well. You just can't, all you can know is that you like it and then just hope for the best and roll the dice. I don't think there's any knowing, well, two-year-olds are, this is their demographic or anything like that. I want, I want to uh, ask you one more question from Jada before you show us some of your superpower of drawing these beautiful, <laughs> beautiful images. And uh, she's asking, why do you use such muted colors? Is, is that such something that's deliberate? No, it's not. I've actually, every time I do a book, I turn it up or I think I turn it up and I'm like, man, I'm really playing with color this time. This is gonna, <laughs> yeah. this is really going to do it. And I'm not sure whether it's that my eyes are just like doused in Vaseline or something, or whether over the course of months I adjust and adjust by little increments, the colors and the saturations and things. And what I end up with was essentially gray, but I put the book out not really realizing I've done that. And I'm thinking this time, this time, and then the reviews come back and it's always like, they're always very nice reviews, but they always kind of start with like in his standard grays and totes. And they're just like, <laughs> Man, I did it again. I thought I really put some color. There's like, there's like a, a shock of blue through this that just blows my mind, and no one else sees it but me because my eyes. I must be just so sensitive or something. But no, it's not deliberate. I, I think that that's um, that's very informative actually because I, I hear that from people, but it's not my idea, and that's a really big sort of deal about talking about your style or whatever it is. Is that I think you're largely out of control of your stylistic choices. I don't think that I think you got to try and do it straight and just try to tell the clearest story you can. Um, and your style's already weird. My eyes are already just completely spoiled. Well, getting a few questions about your eyes, actually. A lovely Leah has said, the way that you draw your eyes are seemingly simple, but they pack so <laughs> much into it. Uh, do you have a wall of eye illustrations? <laughs> no. That, is, the, that, that, is, no. that would be quite spooky, I think, with varying <laughs> angles of eyeballs to convey a feeling. Can you imagine walking into that room? It I actually be, don't like, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't like it, I don't think. There was something I always, in animation question. school, when you go to animation school, one of the jobs is to do um, expressions. So you have a character and they're like, all right, here's your main character for your film, your hypothetical film you're going to make someday. Put, put him in various emotions. Make him sad, make him angry, make him happy, whatever these things are. And I never liked that assignment, partly because it's very hard to draw that assignment. But also I had an intellectual problem with it, at least I told myself I did, where it was like, these are unearned. If someone is sad because they lost their lunch versus being sad because their friend ran away, that's too diff Like sad isn't sad. Sad is a thousand different things. And what the books have become, it's not that I think, like the eyes are a little bit more expressive in this one than in some of the other books. Um, because they had more to do, but largely it's been like a blank eye, as blank as I can make it, with some really big emotional stuff in the text. Um, and then you sort of put it on there as much as I can. I don't know how to draw. We we're actually going to go into this in the drawing a little bit, but it's it's very difficult to draw an expressive eye. I don't try for it. It's very much that I kind of do ten eyes that are as blank as I can try for, it, and then there's an accident in there, and I'll drag those ones over, and those are the ones that sort of back up my emotion. But there's nothing skilled going on there. It's just in the decisions afterwards. Show us, show us. <laughs> all right, all right. We're going to, this is, I, I've also, um, because I'm on the laptop, I'm using my trackpad with my finger to draw. And so it's going to look like that. I'm going to look a little bit off and that's just how that's going to go. Here okay. We go. So you can, you guys can all see that? We can. Right. Okay, great. <clears throat> We're going to draw the alien, I guess, because he's the clearest as far as eyes go. Um, so how I usually do roughs for the books, I don't draw very much for the finals in computers because it prints it weirdly. It looks fine on the screen when you print a computer drawing, at least I do, and it just, everything falls apart. It looks really dead. Um, and so I draw everything for real on my desk with markers or inks or, oh my goodness, see, there we go. There's my trackpad. Uh, so all the characters in this book were drawn actually with Crayola markers, just a really cheap brand. They might have them over there. I don't know, but um, they're like Target brands. You get them 20 for ten dollars or something and i like the cheap ones because they leave little bits behind and i didn't used to like markers because i didn't know how to use them but there's this illustrator pal i have in canada who's getting better and better known for very good reason named sydney smith and sydney oh see i gotta fix that sydney does these beautiful paintings and they're full of texture and motion and life and he partly gets that because he paints very small he paints on like postcard sized pieces of paper and then scans them at really high resolution and prints that out on the book and it's such a good trick. It changed my mind about so many methods or like tools that I thought weren't for me. Just the size that you work at sort of markers look so much better when you draw the characters like a few inches tall versus trying to draw them at full size. Um, 
it was such a great trick. And so all the characters in this book were drawn with marker. Um, and so we're gonna color him in. I usually have more access to textures on here, but because it's a trackpad, uh, they don't have a lot of textures, but that's, well, maybe they do, maybe we can do that, that's something. It's not my favorite texture, but we can live with it. Um, I'll make it bigger, there we go. So here's our alien, we fill in that selection tool. The alien drawings, as a fun fact, is that I didn't really know what I wanted out of him. I had a bunch of different ideas for what a quote unquote alien should be. And I didn't really know, I don't know why I didn't know, this is a pretty obvious one, but I was on a plane, this was a year and a half ago, I guess, before everything shut down, and I was on a plane, um, and I finally, I was just, I had my markers and my sketch pad in my backpack, which I never do, I don't usually do that, but for some reason I was nervous, I wasn't figuring this out, and so I was holding it. And then I just thought of like the War of the Worlds alien. That was all he needed. That was sort of a universal thing. And so I drew a bunch of drawings of, of this guy on this plane. I think I drew like 20 of them on this page. And I looked crazy. I looked like a crazy person on the plane. And this guy next to me who hadn't talked to me the whole time <laughs> looks at me and he's like, what, what, are you, what are you doing over there? And I didn't, really have, I didn't really even know what he was for yet. I had sort of the story. But I said, um, this is an alien for a book I'm working on. <laughs> and I just, you know, you can hear that in your own head. And he didn't talk to me again after that. <laughs> He's out there. I understand why you didn't. Um, but the drawings that are in the book were the plain drawings. I just scanned that sketchbook in when I got home. And those are still the ones. Um, okay, so we have our red eye. And now the important part here is the pupil. And that's the part you're asking about. Because what we do with the pupil, it's not even the eye shape. This shape here isn't very important, it turns out. It's a little important. There are small changes you can make, we can see. But the pupil is most of it. And um, for instance, if we do, <coughs> excuse me, if we do a pupil with space around it, oh, that's terrible. Let's do it again. My poor finger. Okay, so there, and then we color that black like that. So there's lots of information there already. That was those are really quick motions without much thought. But if you sit there and look at what you drew, you're like, well, this could apply to any number of things because there's space around his pupil. He looks a little surprised. His eyes aren't very tall above the pupil, and so he doesn't look too surprised, but he's not. If we, um, if we make his pupil bigger, we'll see the change right away, or even like that. See, now he looks a little bit annoyed because his pupil's hitting the top of the eye. We haven't changed anything. We've only grown this thing in a really crude way. Um, and if we grow it some more, now he's looking right at us, and he's challenging us, sort of. It's an aggressive look. And we haven't changed anything. This was a, this was a finger drawing. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, on a trackpad. It doesn't really, it wasn't like a, a very concentrated decision. It's just this extra part, where you choose to put it then, is very important. And so if we make it a little smaller, just a little smaller, and what I was worried about, the main job of this, <coughs> sorry, alien is to die at the end. And that's a very tricky assignment because you can't make him very much of an emotional being then. He He's not allowed to have a lot of pathos because you're going to kill him and you need to take care of your audience that way. Um, if you make him too emotional or give us any sort of attachment to him, you're going to be bummed out at the end when he has to have a rock fall on him. And so that was the only kind of condition in his eyes was to sort of, if there was excitement or something, it had to look kind of like dumb expression. Like there wasn't a lot of pathos in it. But even when you move the eye around, even when you're just doing this and having him look around and sort of now we're getting to know him just by virtue of watching him. There's nothing he does or being good or looking angry or something. And if you want, you know, we can do this thing where uh, when he looks excited to see the flower, we sort of remove the bottom eyelid a little bit like this. Um, actually, that's not the way it's done at all. The, the bottom eyelid, I use this one a lot because it's a great stand in for either happy or sad eyebrows on top, but it doesn't actually feel like that. So look how happy he looks there. He looks, he looks very happy. And if we make his um, pupil a little smaller and have him look down and maybe wider the way it is in that drawing, he looks very excited to have seen something. And we haven't done it. We have, again, these aren't careful drawings. These are just thinking about what eyes do in real life and then just vaguely approximating it. But if we tell you he's very happy, if we put a flower underneath him, now that's valuable information. Now we know what he's feeling because maybe he's very excited to see this flower. We don't know why. It turns out he's found a victim. But we have information, but it's very little. So uh, it's not about skill with, with, with drawing eyes. I wriggle out of that because um, it is more about context. Picture books are so good at contextualizing drawings, blank ones, to give you information outside of the drawing as far as what the character is feeling like. And you only have to take care of your audience so much for that because uh, kids are really, really great at thinking and feeling into a story. 
If you give them even just a little bit of prompt, they will run with it very far. And so will any audience, but kids are especially good at it. I feel like that today I'm going to spend the rest of my day <laughs> drawing circles and seeing whether I can show <laughs> my extraordinary uh, <laughs> amazement and love and see if you can show joy <laughs> and fear and sorrow. Well, you can write it and then do a very crude drawing next to it that says so, and that's the, that's what makes picture books very fun. We're nearly out of time, John. Uh, someone has just very quickly asked, a couple of people have actually asked, just to know what sort of software that you've just used just then. Mm, uh, yeah, that, every, everybody now wants to go out and be the next John Clawson. I think that's what I'm hearing. Here in Australia, there's enormous competition now for being who you are. Well, stay away. I've, I've barely figured it out myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will not be, no, don't do that. It's very, it's not. <laughs> um, just tell me the software. <laughs> yeah, the software is Photoshop. The software is Photoshop. It's actually a very old version of Photoshop. Um, well, a couple of years now. I, I don't, Photoshop has a thousand million things it can do. And I find that the best way to teach yourself Photoshop is to um, have something in your head and try and get there. Try and just feel your way in the dark and get there with these weird tools that it gives you. Um, tutorials and stuff are kind of useful at the beginning, but then after a while, just make it yours. There's just so many things you can do. It'll overwhelm you. Um, I use it mainly now, uh, even though we drew this on the computer with my trackpad and everything, I do the book roughs for that. But as I say, when it comes to the finals, I paint everything um, on different layers. So in a book like this, um, the sky was one layer. The ground was another layer. I do like 10 grounds once I got the sort of mix I wanted and you just do 10 accidents and hope that they work. And then these guys were all done separately too, markers on sketchbooks mostly. And then uh, the clouds were even separate. They were, um, I had to flip them and reverse them in their value to get the lighter stuff to make that work. So there's a lot of, even though it looks simple, there is a lot of sort of wrestling with your image to make it look all look like it's everything kind of talking to each other properly. Digital stuff can look terrible if you don't finesse the edges of things in particular. The edges are your whole thing. If you, you can, you, as long as your edges are nice and soft or they don't complicate your eye at all, anything can be going on inside these shapes and you're fine. Um, but that's all later. You paint all those pieces once you have your roughs and you know where you want all, all your guys and everything. And then it's like a puzzle. It's a very relaxing way to work because if you draw 20 moles and you only like eight of them, then that's okay. You only have eight moles that you need anyway. And so it's fine. You didn't, it, it's very forgiving and you don't spill coffee over an entire painting that you'll never get back. Um, you only spill it on like a, a sky you'll never get back or something like that. It's great. I love working like that. John, we love you working like that. <laughs> Thank that you're incredible. Here in Australia, you are so loved. You are oh, so loved by, by your readers, by the adults, by everyone, by me, by reading the whole entire Thanks, community. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us from Thank all the coming. way over there to all the way over here. Uh, what, what a treat. Like, really, there are so many people that are just sending through messages saying how much they have enjoyed you oh, thanks, listening guys. to you, how generous you are, and uh, <laughs> also turns out really funny, really, oh. really funny. Well, it's nice when you have your own book to back you up. At least I'm not <laughs> 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 trying to wing it too much. Uh, I feel like this has been possibly one of the most gorgeous Saturday mornings here in Melbourne that ever was. To oh. you. Take care, John. Take care. Thanks. Over there. You guys too. You guys too. Everything's coming around over here. I hope it is there too. <laughs> we're we're we're, in a, we're in feeling pretty strong here. Uh, farewell, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We Thanks have been again, delighted guys. to have you. Uh, really, an honour. Thank you, John. <laughs>